back in my college days when I hung out with, uh, with uh, Christians from a lot of different traditions, and particularly some of those campus groups, you know, the kind of evangelical groups, it was not uncommon to ask someone the question, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would you be convicted? Did you ever hear that? Yes. <laughs> did you ever hear that? Probably not. No. No. You didn't run in those circles in college, no, did you, No, I did not. <laughs> If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would you be convicted? In other words, is there enough evidence from you or someone else that would convince someone that what you say you believe actually reflects, is reflected in, uh, in, which, in your conduct? So it's, a good, it's, it's an interesting thing to ask. It's a little bit of a silly question. But it's an interesting thing to ask, particularly on this third Sunday of Advent, uh, because we have the story, again, of John the Baptist. And if you remember... Hopefully you'll remember this. We're, 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 we're talking each of these Sundays of Advent about, um, about one of the verbs in the gospel that helps us along our Advent journey. So uh, you may remember that the first Sunday of Advent, the verb was keep awake, right? Do you remember that? You wouldn't remember that. You were I, asleep. I, do, I was not awake. <laughs> no. <laughs> keep awake. Last week, uh, the verb was prepare. And so this week... The verb, it's right there at the very beginning of the gospel, according to John, talking about John the Baptist and who John was. John came to testify. He came to testify. Uh, and, and when we hear that word, we often, often the images that come to mind are images of courtrooms and trials. Right, Counselor? Yes, that's yes. pretty common, isn't it? That's often what people think of when they hear the word testify. And so that's why when I, when that's, when I, when I realize that's the verb for today, that question ca ca captured my, uh, my attention from my olden days in college. Uh, does our life testify to what we say we believe? Does our life actually reflect some sense of faith? I think all too often we see our Christian faith uh, simply as a balm for our weary soul, and it is that. But that's just the mere foundation of our life of faith. Christian faith has always been something that called people to a mission, to sacrifice, to service, to give our life for the mission of God, for the kingdom of God, to, to, to give everything we have to serve that larger purpose. And so the question is, does our life, do our words and actions actually testify to uh, the presence of God within us that upends us, that turns us inside out, that completely transforms us into someone else? Or is it just, as one of my colleagues is fond of saying, is it just an accessory that we, that we sort of take out and put on when it suits us for some reason? Uh, and in our culture, let's be honest, faith is often used as an accessory when it helps us to look good and fit the part and not something that actually dwells deep within and is transforming. There are three parts I think, to testifying that I, wanna, I want us to think about today. And the first one is probably obvious and yet so woefully inadequate, and that is that the first part of testifying to, to, to the truth is that we have to learn the truth of the kingdom of God. We have to learn it. Most of us have grown up in this, sort of this, this culture that assumed everyone was Christian, and therefore that everything we did was Christian, that we stopped trying to learn the truth of the kingdom of God. One of the most disheartening things for clergy, I will tell you, is how few people who come to church really put much effort into learning more about what their faith means. There's sort of this assumption that we already know everything we need to know. I was confirmed after all, or I went to seminary. I was actually ordained to the priesthood 26 years ago today. Absolutely sure that if I was ordained and had finished seminary, I knew everything I needed to know. What more was there to learn? Ha! I've learned so much more since that ordination 26 years ago than, than, I, than, than before then. It's astounding. How much time do we spend learning the truth of the gospel? How much, do we time, how much time do we spend uh, in a Bible study or class or going back over a sermon or following up on something that our, our church leaders said about the way this all works, pushing against it, wrestling with it, digging deeper? How much time do we spend if something doesn't seem, doesn't make sense to us or is disconcerting to us, do we sit and go deep and say, God, I need to sit with this for a little bit and learn something from it? We're still learning a ton, right? We have conversations almost every day where we're, we're reading something, discovering something, learning something, sharing it with each other. It's one of the great gifts of a life of faith. 
And there's no way to faithfully testify to have a life that actually befits the kingdom of God if we're not continually learning more about God's ways and about how those work in the world as the world constantly changes. I'm fond of saying, God may never change, but the world around us and we change constantly. And so understanding the implications for that truth in a particular time and place requires constant attention and work, and it's blessed and holy and wonderful work. There's a, so then there's a correlated piece to that. Sort of the other side of the coin is that in, in the process of learning the truth of the kingdom of God, we actually have to work to see clearly the evil one's lies. Uh, because, because the evil one puts lies in the world around us and in our hearts all the time. And they're not the obvious things. They're not the obvious evils. They're the little subtle things that sound maybe just almost okay and aren't. And they're not really that new. In fact, one of the best books about this is The Screwtape Letters. Were you, were you thinking that too? Yeah. This, you've read it. It's C.S. Lewis. It's a classic. If you haven't read it, read it. it. How long does it take to read The Screwtape Letters? You can do it in two days. Yeah, a couple days. Not that long. But, it's, but Lewis does in that book a great job of giving a glimpse of how it is really that the evil one sort of works those lies into our lives. And as much as we need to learn the truth of the kingdom of God, we also have to see the lies for what they are. And we miss them all the time, and they, they become pernicious and seductive and all those kinds of things. It would be nice if those lies weren't attractive, but they are. <clears throat> And so we have to constantly look at those and name them for ourselves and one another. We have to name them as a community of faith <clears throat> and turn away from those. Then, when we've done those, then comes the third piece, which is testifying. Speaking. Truth. With both integrity and love. Not one or the other, but both. Integrity, meaning we mean what we say. There's a consistency between actions and thoughts and a constancy about it in our lives. And love. Speaking the truth may not always be happy or easy, but it's never done spitefully, it's never done angrily, it's never done to make someone's life worse or our own. So we testify or speak with integrity and love, and we do it in word and action. I know we want to say, well, I don't talk about these things, it's a private thing. I just try to be a good person. That's not really testifying, and that's not the call of the gospel. Our baptismal covenant says it very clearly, doesn't it? Will you, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? That's what we sign up for when we become Christians. So we actually kind of follow in this legacy of John the Baptist, hopefully not in quite so um, obnoxious a way most of the time, although maybe sometimes. And you and I may never um, be imprisoned or killed because of it, but we can't shy away from that testifying, that truth that, of which we live, just because it might become inconvenient or uncomfortable or difficult. Because what we know, what John knew, is that living into, embracing, and speaking out that truth of the kingdom of God, dwelling within us, uh, and, and therefore pervading the world, is of surpassing value. There's nothing greater, nothing more worthy or worthwhile for us than to, than to build a life that befits the kingdom of God. Even if that question was silly, it's worth asking. Would anyone actually believe that we're Christians other than the fact that we say it? Does anything we do or say actually look like it? Because it needs to. There needs to be that integrity and that love in our words and our actions. So we're continuing now, two weeks plus into the season of Advent, continuing to keep awake because Jesus is coming, preparing so that we're ready. And now, as we've prepared, we're ready to speak, to live in a way that befits receiving that light of Christ coming at the, at the celebration of Christmas. And so today, I challenge each of us to look at the ways we can better learn the truth of the kingdom of God, to look at the ways we can more clearly see the lies of the evil one, and then, by the grace of God, testify.